All right. Do you have any questions before we get going? All right. Well, last time, the, the big point in the end was you should be doing, if anything, when you're doing a comparison of any results, you need, you need distributions. And you should be doing permutation tests or randomization tests. Remember, randomization tests is just like a permutation test, but if the number of permutations of your data is too high, you just take some sufficiently large subset of that by just shuffling every time and re redoing the experiment. And by experiment, I mean redoing the, like, let's assume it didn't matter, so we randomly assign who was in what group to get that distribution, and then we check where we actually, this is the distribution of if it was random chance, and this is what we actually observed, so how many of the random chance were the same or better than what we observed, and that's the probability of us getting something like this by random chance. That can be time consuming, and so we have a couple of quick and dirty approximations for it, something like a t-test or a Mann-Whitney-U test. A Mann-Whitney-U, if you're going to do one of these two, Mann-Whitney-U is the preferred one, I would say. Uh, but obviously, your permutation test is better. And if you do all of these, you'll get slightly different numbers in the end, and it's based on a lot of different things. Uh, permutation test or randomization test is by far the one you should want to do. All right. Any questions about that idea before we continue? Yeah. Uh, what happens if it's not possible for the complexity of the, of the solution to make uh, multiple runs? So you mean how, like, it just it takes too long to run? Yeah, uh, if that happens, you should, like if you're worried about tonight's assignment, well, you should have started that three weeks ago. That's the correct answer. The reality is, you better have some distributions to compare, because if you don't, that's bad, right? Because it does take a long time to run these things. Uh, so if you're, what if you don't? You better. That's the answer, really, at the end of the day. If this is a situation where like, there's, there's two answers to this question. The first answer to the question is, if someone is asking, and I'm not saying this is you. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying this is you. If you're asking because, well, the assignment's due tonight, and it takes six hours for one run, I ain't getting, I, I ain't getting like, 30 runs of one set of data, and then another 30 runs of another set of data, and then another 30 runs, and so on, and so on, and so on. Then, well, you screw it up. Uh, if this is a question like, okay, look, I'm doing a big research project, I've got a bunch of people on my team, and we're doing all this analysis, and it takes weeks to run a single thing, and we do at the end of the day have a deadline, and in order to do this right, there just is a, there is a limitation here, well then you do the best to explain what your limitation is and justify why you don't have enough data to do a proper thorough analysis, and then it's up to the reviewers. That's what you do. At the end of the day, you don't get to say, well, I ran out of time, therefore you should be okay with my less than ideal analysis. They get to say no. So that's, that's the situation. Uh, there have been times where, like there are some fields of research where they're pretty forgiving on that type of stuff, and there are some where they are not where it's like, nope, not enough, Reje like you get desk rejected, which means it doesn't even go up for review. The editor sees your submission and goes, no, I'm not, I'm not wasting my reviewer's time. Um, and there are some that are a little bit more forgiving, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the editor and the, re and the reviewers to decide what to do. You can maybe try to go like, well, I know I can get better results if I let it run longer, but I just don't have the time. You could try that. Don't let it run for six hours. Don't let it run for three weeks. Let it run for two weeks. Maybe you can make the analysis work then. But if you know that your results aren't as good as they should be, well, that's kind of the answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions about that? So, 
so for the most part, all of the problems we've been looking at have been single objective problems. There are exceptions, like I think on this on the first assignment. Like, did anyone in here do the like vehicle routing problem? Did they try that? No. Okay. Well, then all of the problems that we've looked at so far have been single objective. But that is obviously a small set of all of the potential problems out there. There are a lot of problems out there that are multi-objective. Sometimes these objectives are like cooperative, for lack of a better term, where they kind of just go together really well. Where I want, well, as opposed to sometimes you have objectives that are in conflict with one another. I want to buy a big house, but I don't want to pay a lot. Well, those tend to go against each other. Yeah, consider buying a house. What do I want in my house? Well, there's a couple of objectives I want to fit. I want a low price. I want at least four bedrooms. I want to have a, 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 the smallest commute distance possible. I want to have it close to all the amenities I care about. And I want it to look nice. Some of these uh, features are quite subjective in like, OK, the aesthetic, OK, whatever. Amenities that what do you actually care about? But you know, some of them complement each other. Small commute and amenities are probably related. You know, if you work in downtown, chances are all the amenities you care about are like near downtown. So you know, they're going to go hand in hand. But some are in conflict. And this is where it gets tricky. At least four bedrooms and close to amenities and low price. These can be a bit of a problem. So you, know, you can kind of think of it like this. We're going to focus on size versus price. As price goes down, the size goes down. As price goes up, the size goes up. So if you look at this little cheesy example, we've got all these yellow data points are, a, are houses. OK? And you'll notice there's this like line. We're going to talk a little bit about that line. That line is actually quite interesting. Does anyone know what that line is called by chance? Well, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk about it. One of the easiest ways to deal with, one of the easiest ways to deal with multi-objective problems is something called scalarization, which deep, by the way, really like forces you to do, whether you like it or not. Not. You're using deep and you're wondering why does my fitness metric always need to be a tuple? Well, it's because it's actually designed to work with multi-objective functions or multi-objective problems. And what you put in the tuple is the weight or the scale for each of the objectives that you want to work with. So scalarization is the process of scaling the various features to be optimized and combining them into a single value. It's a way to turn multi-objective problems effectively into a single objective problem in like, in like the least painful way possible. But there are some problems with this, which we'll talk about. And it is an a priori process, meaning the decision about the scales must be done before the search starts. You'll notice a priori, a lot of times people like to use Latin words to sound smarter. So a priori, it's just a fancy way to say we have to make a decision before a search. One of the simplest forms of scalarization is a weighted sum. And this is what deep is like doing. Effectively, what you do is you come up with a set of weights for each of the objectives we want to optimize, whether that's minimization or maximization. Like in the example of the house, we want to maximize the size while minimizing the price. Okay. The scale of each individual objective being optimized, OK, scale each individual objective being optimized and then add them together into a single value. Basically, we have, for however many objectives we want to maxim, like optimize, some function to optimize. Here we have m of them. And we have m weights, one for each of the objectives. This might be a positive one. This one might be a negative one. If that was the case, we are weighting our 
We're waiting. Never mind. But anyway, long story short, it's the sum of all the wait times, there, like the scales of the, of the objective function. Where this fancy little expression here, well, if we have m objective functions, each chromosome, that objective function on that chromosome gives us some fitness value. You scale it accordingly, and then you add them all together. m is the number of objectives being optimized. f of i is a function returning the ith objective function on chromosome x, and wi is the weight scale of objective i. If one objective is more important than the other, so this is, this is where the, the magic happens. Here's the trick. It's possible that you have one objective that, like it's tricky, right? If I want to, let me see if I've got, if I vi revisit the example here real quick. First, we need to understand that this is a tricky problem, coming up with the weight, right? Like, Like, think of the GP example. One of the examples we talk about with GP turning into a multi-objective function is if we, if, if we, like, look, if we're doing symbolic regression, we want to minimize the mean squared error, right? We also want to minimize the size of the trees, right? We want, our, we want to eliminate bloat. So what we could do, and we talked about this. I'm not saying you should do this on your assignment, but you could. It's kind of easy to do. What you could do is you could say, OK, I want to minimize the mean squared error, and I also want to minimize the size of the trees, OK? Because I want to have there's still some selection pressure to help reduce bloat. Which objective is more important? Is it better to have a function that has a lower mean squared error, or is it better to have a function that's smaller? Like a smaller S expression, a smaller tree. What do you think? This isn't a trick question. Come on, the first years do better than you. Now, sit down. When you're ready to show up, I'll come back. Mean well, mean squared error. What do you mean? Can you be more specific? Right, so, so obviously that's more important, yeah. right? You want a function that's, that's going to fit the data. That's more important than having a smaller, than having a, uh, having a, a smaller tree. So that then begs the question, what do we weight these things at, right? Like, let's say I have... And let's say these values are already scaled such that the values are similar to one another, right? We have a mean squared error. Actually, no. Let's take a moment and really think about how complex it is to, to pick these weights. If I have something that has a mean squared error of 27 and something that has a, a tree size of 10, right? And I want to minimize both these, both these things. So what I could do is I could add these together and multiply them by weight 1, weight 2, and I get some value I care about. So here, let's say the weights are equal, 1 and 1. So this gives us a total score of 37. All right? There. Now we have our fitness value. Okay, so what does this mean? Because all of these fitness values, they only really have meaning once they're compared to something else. They're relative. Their, their value comes with how they compare, like chromosomes, fitnesses, only mean something in the context of its population. 
So if I have something like uh, 14 and 11, right, with the same weight of 1 and 1, that gives us a, no, let's, uh, hmm, yeah, okay, that gives us a fitness of, of uh, 25. Not so bad, because clearly, I mean, a lower mean squared error, that's better. Yeah, sure, it's a little bit bigger, uh, a little bigger tree, but whatever. But then, like, the problems obviously arise whenever we have something like uh, 22 and 4. And that has a mean squared error of uh, 26. And you're left going like, well, hmm, this is tricky. And what if we had something like a mean squared error of uh, uh, 29 and 5? Whoop. Well, that gives us 34. So once you start to see how all these things compare to one another, we're left going like, well, huh, like 34 is better than 37, but it had a worse mean squared error. Let me come up with a couple of more examples of, of extreme cases to maybe make this a little bit more obvious. First, let's make one thing obvious. If we have something that has an error of 10 and 27, these have the same fitness. Does that mean, come on. I mean, I think I really care about the mean squared error a lot more. So although this is bigger, I mean, maybe it needed to be bigger in order to be able to fit the data this well. A 10 mean squared error is way better than 27. Whoops, having a hard time with the markers today. Yet they have the same fitness, right? Like, really? Really? Or if we come up with a case of like, uh, let's make this 12. plus uh, 25, 37. Like, well, it's smaller, but it's got a worse mean squared error, but they have the same fitness value. I, I don't know, should, should they really have the same fitness value? Maybe, but I feel like I kind of I kind of want this one to be better. Like I want to prioritize the I want to prioritize the mean squared error a little more. We also have the problem of like what is a twenty seven? Is a twenty seven in the scale of mean squared error? And a ten on the scale like these are two completely different dimensions. What's a 27 versus a 10 versus a 10 versus a 27, right? Like, what, what, is that, what does that mean, right? Like, is a one unit improvement on size equivalent to a one unit improvement in mean squared error? Probably not. So, like, these things aren't scaled intrinsically on the same way. And I also might not care about, like I care about both features, I care about both things I want to optimize, but I end up caring about mean squared error a lot more. So what I can do is I can say something like, okay, look, what if I care about this, the mean squared error, a lot more than the 
than the side. So what I can do is I can select my weight. I care about this two to one, meaning this has a, let's make for easy math now, 25. 50, 60, so I'm gonna make this a weight of two, and this will have a weight of one. 20, 47, and 24 plus 25, 49. Suddenly, we can see how the weights that I get to pick impact, well, which one is the best one here? Well, this one, because, yeah. No, it doesn't matter. You can. It doesn't really matter. Um, but what are the right weights? How do I pick these weights? Do I really care about uh, mean squared r twice as much? Should this be a a four and this be a point five? Like I I don't know. Like I just picked two and one. Looks pretty good, but is that really is that is that really how much I value? Because what I really have to do is like if I'm picking a house and I want to pay as little as possible, but I want a bigger size. How do I value these two conflicting dimensions relative to one another? That's my goal with picking the weight, but it's hard to pick, right? Like, it's very difficult to pick. Does that, is the problem clear? Like, I value a big house, but how much more do I value, or less, do I value a big house relative to paying, like, as little as possible? That's tricky, right? And I'm trying to crunch that down to one number. That's what I'm trying to do here. All right, what would I say? Okay, if one objective is more important than the other, assign it a stronger weight. Use negative weights to account for objectives that are to be minimized versus maximized. Unfortunately, however, weighted sums do not work well beyond two or three objectives because it becomes so goddamn hard to balance the weights of these things all relative to one another. Because you end up having, you end up having a bit of a combinatorial explosion where, okay, I want to compare weights to price, right? And I have to do this comparison, right? How much, like what weight do I have relative to those, like, those things to one another, right? But if I add another dimension in there, well, now I have to account for, like how much do I care about this relative to this, and this relative to this, and this relative to this, this to this, this to this. Th we start to have a bit of a problem. If I add a fourth, a fourth feature, suddenly we've got a uh, hell of a, and it just grows and grows and grows because whenever you pick a weight, it's always about one thing relative to another thing. And then we have to balance this in this growing complex situation with this combinatorial explosion. We got a problem. So using something like a weighted sum, I want to be very clear, is very easy. In terms, it's easy in terms of implementation. It's easy in terms of like understanding what it means. It's easy if you have a good sense of one, how much do you value one feature over another feature. And it's great when you have small number of features, like things that you want to minimize, maximize, things that you're optimizing. It's fantastic. But of course, there are limitations. Some of the most obvious is sometimes it's hard to pick the weights. How much do you really care about one over the other? How many dimensions do you really have? I don't really know. And some of this is like in the eye of the beholder. Like how much does one person value one thing over another person value that, that thing? Like is, is the problem clear? Yeah? Yeah, it's not always easy to assign weight. So instead we have something called dominance. Let me, let me explain it and then I'll explain it. All right, so sometimes it's not possible to truly select the best 
option. Sometimes that's also like a foolish question to ask. Like what is, what is the best mean in some context? If one house has a lower price than another, then that's good. And if one house is bigger than another, that's good. But how does one compare price to some? It's difficult. It may be clear to so, that some option, like in spite of this though, it may be clear that some options are better than others. If a house is bigger and cheaper than another, that's good. So in the above example, so this is where we start to, okay, let me explain. Okay, given the goal of buying the largest house for as little as possible, it's difficult to pick a data point on the plot that is the best option. This is because it may be difficult to compare data points across dimensions, price versus size. However, although it's difficult to select the best option, it may be simple to identify options that are better than others. So when you look at this, this one here is, has a higher price than this one and is smaller. That sucks. This one here has a higher price, or a lower price than this one, and is bigger, like this, than this one. So this one, this one sucks. Like, you can end up creating like, well, okay, this is a dominated set, this is a dominated set, and this is a dominated set. Basically, all of the things in here are dominated by something in this blue set, and all of the things in the green set dominate all the things in the blue set and, and the red set. So you can end up making this like, this series of dominant sets. <clears throat> okay, so five data points, A, B, C, D, E, for some two-dimensional minimization problem. Each dimension representations, represents some objective to be minimized. Some data points are difficult to compare, but data points are dominated by other data points. So, in the above example, point A is better than B in both dimensions. So, A is better than B in both dimensions. I want to minimize something. I want to minimize these two things in this example. A is better than B, obviously. Why? Because it's closer to this axis and it's closer to that axis. I'm happy. Right? So if I gave you the choice between A and B in this complex multidimensional problem, that's easy for you to pick. It's easy for you to say, well, A is clearly better than B. Why? Because it's better in all the dimensions I care about. A is worse than C in one dimension, but equal in another. So here we're like, well, okay, look. If I gave you the choice between C and A, which would you pick? Pardon? C, remember, this is a minimization problem. Something closer to zero, zero is better. So you want to try again? A. Why A? Well, because Look, A and C are equal in like this dimension, like, well, I mean, that way. But at the end of the day, A is better than C in this dimension. So I, 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 I would still pick C. A is worse than E in both dimensions, right? And it's difficult to compare points A and D since one is better in one dimension, but worse in the other. What this is showing is how we can have funny, funny comparisons. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not obvious. A and B, that's easy. A is better in both dimensions. I like A. E is better than A because it's better in both dimensions, and it's obviously better than B as well. A and C, well, that's, sure, it's tricky in one dimension because they're the same, but A is better than C in the other dimension. And assuming I have a good view of like what's going on, A, A is probably the better choice because, sure, it's hard to say which one's better in one dimension, but it's definitely better in the other dimension. Yeah, clear? But D, D is tricky because... It's better, D is closer to this axis, meaning it's better than E in one dimension, 
But it's further away in this axis, meaning it's worse in the other dimension. So how do you pick? Well, with this strategy of finding dominant sets, I would say, yeah, you can't really pick. They, they're in the same set. They're kind of equivalent. Now, what's nice about this dominant set situation is, like going back to this house example, if I were to say, OK, look, here's all the houses you can go buy in Antigonish right now. And I've come up with this dominant set. And you say, well, what's the best one? Right? And I go, I can't really say that. But we've got these. These are the ones you want to look at. They're the best value, best price to size ratio. Right? So at the end of the day, if I were to use like some optimization strategy for picking the best house to buy, and I'm using this dominant set strategy, I can't come back to you. Often, I can't come back to you with a single answer, being like, here you go. Best I can do is be like, here, this is the subset that you can now choose from. Whatever you pick in here, you're not losing. If you picked one of these ones, you're losing. If you pick one of these ones, you're losing. If you pick one of the green one, it's up to you. You get to pick the one you want. Maybe once you have a smaller subset, it becomes easier to pick. Maybe it's easier for you to say what do you really value more. Yeah? So uh, here, one would say that point A dominates both B and C. Uh, although A and C are equal along the x-axis, A is still better than the y. Thus, one would still choose A. Yeah. Further, point A is dominated by point E, All right? So if we're looking at A, everything up here is dominated. Everything down here is dominating. Any questions about this idea? Yeah. Well, no, a, don't say A is at 0, 0. No. But assume this is 0, 0. Okay, so it's still all in the positive. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Even then, we could make it all work. So the point I'm making here is in the end, we can create a series of sets. Everything in this set of the green set is better than everything in the, in the blue set and the red set. Everything in the blue set is better than everything in the red set. So if I had to like order these things, I can come up with an ordering, but they're like, it's almost like you're creating like a tier list, right? We all know tier lists are, are a thing, right? It's, that's like what we're doing. You can't order the things really in the set, but you can say what is absolutely better than others. And we can use this in evolutionary computation. So Pareto sets. Has anyone here Pareto before? The Pareto principle? Pareto set. This very, 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 very famous economist that's, that, that has some really good advice for everybody. Anyone, has anyone ever heard of the 80-20 rule? That's like the Pareto. That's, that's a Pareto thing. The 80, raise your hand if you don't know what the 80-20 rule is. I'm going to change your life. Everyone, else, Only one person doesn't know. Wow, OK. You don't know. You don't know. OK. The 80-20 rule is, and this is so true. And you can apply it to like almost everything. And it's just generally, it's true. So it's a really cool, good like rule of thumb to follow. It requires, like, and we can apply this to everything. It requires very little effort to get like 80% of the way there. It requires a lot more effort to get the rest of the way. More precisely, it requires like 20% of the work. If you had to say, um, work. How would 
I draw this? Like effort, E, versus uh, achievement. I don't know, right? You always get things that look like this. 20% of the way here, let's say this is 20%. 80, 20. It requires very little effort to get most of the way there. It requires a hell of a lot more effort to just get it to the end. It's really easy to get 80% of the way there, and then it's really hard to get that last 20%. And this works like everywhere. When you look at like employees, you could say like, you know, 20% of your employees are doing like the, the lion's share of the work, right? Um, you, you could apply this to like anything. Always think of every particular problem that you come across in terms of this 80-20 rule and the world will make a lot more sense to you. It's really easy to get 80% in the class. It's really hard to get 90% in the class. It's, yeah. It's really easy to, like the time it would take for you to master playing piano, sorry. The amount of time it would you could learn to play piano pretty good relatively quickly. But in order to be really goddamn good at piano, it takes a hell of a lot of work. And so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. This 80-20 rule, you can apply it to like everything. Here's how you apply the 80-20 rule in your life. Let's say we're in a problem where you want to say, I want to buy a new guitar, right? I want to buy a new guitar, OK? Now, I want to make sure I'm getting a good guitar, but I don't want to pay a lot in the same way with the house, right? But we all know that, like, in terms of, like, if I know the 80-20 rule exists in general, I know that, like, the difference, if I have a guitar worth uh, $500 and $1,000 and $2,000, right? And I can't really go find at my guitar store. There's no guitars really worth more than $2,000, let's say. I know that the difference between this and this, even though the difference is only $500, I have a pretty good feeling that the, like paying $1,000 for a guitar is going to get me a hell of a lot more of a guitar than a, maybe this is a bad example. Let's make this like $750. Paying $250 more, like, hmm, if I want the best value, you'd say like, well, if everything followed a linear thing here, if this all followed a linear scale, I might conclude, well, this is like, uh, like $250 better. But this is $1,000 better. So I'm going to get a $1,000 better guitar if I pay $1,000 more. Well, yeah, but you got to remember that this almost certainly is following the Pareto thing, meaning the difference between 750 and a thousand is like this much, but the difference between a thousand and two thousand is that much. And yeah, it's better, but like I get a lot more for paying 250 than I would if I paid a thousand. Is this clear? That's, that's another application of the Pareto rule. How do I find that best value? Honestly, look for the 80-20 point. Sometimes that's not obvious. Sometimes like that, there, there might not be no such thing as the 80-20 point, but you can kind of get a sense of where it would be. So you can use this 80-20 rule 
to, to, to your advantage when buying something, right? I want a new GPU for my computer. Well, look, it doesn't cost a lot of money, like a new graphics card. It doesn't cost a lot of money to get a really good graphics card. But it costs a lot of money to buy, like, the best graphics card. But how much better is the best than the, like, if I were to spend 500 bucks, I can get a pretty, I, I get a pretty good graphics card. But if I spend $1,500, I can get like one of the top of the line ones. But the difference between like the really good one and the top of the line one, what am I really going to see? Probably not much of a difference, right? Like, so you can kind of play that game, that 80-20. You can apply this to everything. Think of the world in the 80-20 rule. You might become a lot more cynical if you do, by the way. <laughs> Fair warning. Twenty percent of the students show up to class, but you're the best eighty percent. You, you, like you, you achieve so much more, right? Obviously. Any other, any questions about that before I carry on with the Pareto sets? The Pareto sets are are not the same thing, but it all comes from the same person. All right, Pareto sets. Given a set of solutions S and some subset of solutions Q, and it's a proper subset, a data point X in S is non-dominated. By the set D, if no solution Y in D dominates X. If this throws you off, just slow down and think about it. A set of non-dominated solutions N, which is a superset of S, defines the Pareto optimal set. It's possible to create multiple Pareto sets by repeatedly applying the process on the different sets, uh, on the set difference, S minus N. Basically, I can look at these data points here. I want to minimize two features, F2 and F1, whoops, All right? I want to minimize these things. I can go through the whole set and find a non-dominating set, or sorry, a dominating set, and I get this green point. Then, is that right? Is that green? Is that blue one there? Well, I'm not going to pick it apart right now. And then what you do is you basically repeat the process by eliminating all the green ones, and then do it again. Then you find the blue set. Then you do it again. Then you find the red set. Then you do it again. Then you find the black set. You keep, keep doing it again. So when it comes to like evolutionary computation and you want to pick the fitness, well, you can start to incorporate these ideas. We're like, okay, no, the blue ones are absolutely worse than the green ones. But they're better than the black and the red ones, right? So that's how you can incorporate this idea. It's a little bit more complex to implement, but it has so much value. <clears throat> Since evolutionary computation, and this is, the, like, here's the reason why, like, look, evolutionary computation is a population-based search. At the end of the day, you always get, like, a suite of solutions that you get to pick from. I know at our stage, we're probably just going and finding, when we have our final population, you've probably been going through just picking the best one, right? Fair enough, when you've got a single objective, that's pretty, pretty straightforward, right? You want the best solution. But once you start dealing with multi-dimensional, like, multi-objective problems, Having a set of solutions in the end is fantastic. You get to pick. You get to say, okay, well, this one's better in one dimension, but worse in another dimension, and this one's better in the other dimension. And then you get a chance to pick. It gives you a suite of solutions, which is fantastic. So they work really well with this Pareto style optimization. The population can be ranked into Pareto sets. The Pareto optimal set will contain all good solutions. And consider the issue with weighted sum and selecting weights for different uh, weights for difficult to quantify and compare features. Yeah, long story short, this is arguably a better way to do comparisons for multi-objective problems. A better way to deal with multi-objective problems, especially when you're working with evolutionary computation. Any questions about this? But warning, this is more complex to implement. It is. It's not too bad, I want to be clear. It's not overly, like, you definitely are capable of doing it. I have no doubt about that. But it is a little bit more complex than just assigning a few weights, because assigning weights is really freaking easy. Any questions? All right. Well, I guess I'll see you all later. <laughs>